We're going to finish up Matthew chapter 3 tonight. And um, last week we looked at the, the baptism. Why was it essential for Jesus to be baptized? And we saw that John and Jesus were actually redoing again that fulfilling that, that Jesus talks about, the fulfilling of righteousness, was actually with Jesus, concerning Jesus, because he is a, a priest. And so, um, and because he's a priest, there was this ceremonial washing that he had to do. And then, of course, because he identified with the people, before the people could actually enter into the first and second temples that were built, they had to actually be immersed in water and totally cleansed before they were allowed to even enter in. And so it was a picture of Jesus preparing himself for the ministry and doing the things that require, were required of him as a priest and also as one who was going to be doing work inside of the temple or entering into the temple. And we know that in Mark, we see Jesus when he walks into the synagogue and he pulls out the, uh, the reading of the day, which was Isaiah 61, and he basically proclaims that I'm here, you know. The Lord has anointed me with his Holy Spirit. He's called me to do these things. And so tonight I want to touch on when Jesus comes out of the water after the baptism. There's a significant event that happens there. And um, if you'd open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 3, verse, starting in verse 16. It says, And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. <clears throat> Excuse me, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So Jesus is immersed into the water by John. And as he comes up and out of the water, we see this moment in time when the Spirit of God is going to descend upon him like a dove. The work of the Holy Spirit is essential for anybody who's going to do the work of the Lord. Any of you that are in ministry know that if you're working under your own power, you typically are going to run into a lot of problems. You're either going to be drained spiritually or emotionally or physically. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in order for us to be propelled forward. Now, <clears throat> Jesus again is playing out things that were happening in the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. And so, in the book of Isaiah, starting in Isaiah 59 through the last chapter, Isaiah 66, the Holy Spirit is mentioned more times than in any other books in the Old Testament. And Isaiah is prophesying about the doom that is going to come when the Babylonian and Assyrian armies are going to come and utterly destroy the nation of Israel. And so he's anointed with the Holy Spirit. He's proclaiming the judgment that is going to come. And so this power of the Holy Spirit is essential for any worker in, in, in God. And, it's, and it was essential for Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was still man. Even though he was the God-man, he still had humanity. He still had flesh. So, let's look at this. When Jesus comes up out of the water, the moment when Jesus is coming out, Matthew says he went up, not came out. So, there's a thought here that Jesus literally went up out of the water, like up out of the water, ascended out of the water. It doesn't say he came out. It says he went up. And so the wording there, especially in the Septuagint, especially in the Greek, gives us the impression that Jesus, it wasn't so much John bringing him out, but rather Jesus was, was he went up. Almost like when he ascended into heaven, it says he went up. Same kind of thought there. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus has also been baptized, he was praying. In Luke chapter 3, 21, we read this. This is an interesting tidbit. Only Luke brings this point out. It says, now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus had also been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened. 
So Luke brings this thought process that as Jesus was being baptized, as he was being put into the water, Jesus was literally praying. But what was he praying for? What is he praying for? What would Jesus be praying for? Well, in Jewish thought, he's praying for the Holy Spirit. Why do I say that? If you go to Luke chapter 11, verse 13, Jesus says something very interesting here. He says, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? If you've never asked God to infill you, to fill you with the Holy Spirit, you're missing out on a blessing. Yes, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit when you come into a relationship with Jesus. But we know there are two different events that happen. We know that when Jesus had resurrected from the dead, it says that Jesus breathed on the disciples in John chapter 20, and they received the Holy Spirit, salvation. But in Acts chapter 2, we see a total different event. These are sanctified, Holy Spirit-grounded disciples who are who are told by jesus to wait on the holy spirit what is jesus saying there he's saying look you may have been sealed you may have received the holy spirit but you have not received the power of the holy spirit john and we're going to allude to this in a little bit he said that jesus was going he baptized with water but one who is coming will baptize you with fire meaning power So we see here that Jesus is put into the water. Luke says that he prays. And then as he's coming up or out or whatever it was, we, we're not quite sure. But there's this intimate moment that happens between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, here's what you need to understand. It does not say the crowd saw anything. If you read the verses again, it says that Jesus saw the Holy Spirit descending. The crowd was unaware of what was going on. The, the Holy Spirit descends upon him like a dove. It says it took form. The Holy Spirit takes form. It took the form of a dove, descends upon Jesus. But why a dove? Why did the Holy Spirit take on the form of a dove. What's the purpose? Well, there's always purpose in the Bible. Let's look at doves. First off, doves are a symbol of purity in the Bible. Song of Solomon. Haha, <laughs> we were just talking about this the other day. <laughs> Chapter 6, verse 9, the first part of it says, My dove, my perfect one, is the only one, the only one of her mother, pure to her who bore her. So doves are a symbol of purity. When, when you've ever, if you've ever been to a wedding and they let the doves go and all that kind of stuff, you know, I mean, it's because it's, it's a, a beautiful, serene scene and the, the purity of what's happening there in that moment when these two lives come together. So the doves are a symbol of purity. Secondly, they're a symbol of gentleness. Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, he says, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. That word innocent there actually translates into the word gentleness in the Greek. Third, doves are a symbol of meekness. Song of Solomon again in verse 2, or chapter 2, verse 14 says, O oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the crannies of the cliff, let me see your face, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. And lastly, it's a symbol of peace and rest. Genesis chapter 8, verse 11, it says, And the dove came back to him, Noah, in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. The carnage that had happened on the earth through the flood had now subsided. And this dove that he kept sending out now comes back with this olive leaf in its mouth. And if you've, if you've ever seen any of these 
I, I used to see them all the time on these commercials. I can't remember what they were for, like UNICEF or whatever it was. They had the dove with the little, the little plucked uh, olive leaf, meaning it was a, a, a time of peace. And Listen, the bottom line is this. The reason that the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus like a dove because it's a manifestation of what Jesus is going to do and who he is. Jesus is pure. He was sinless. He never sinned, ever. He was sinless. He was pure. He was gentle. Man, the Lord was so gentle. I've seen so many things make it look like the Lord was this rude, hard, harsh person. That was not his nature, man. He was meek. He was strength under power. His voice was sweet to those who heard it. And Jesus brings peace and rest to those who encounter him. So the dove descending on Jesus the Holy Spirit, I should say, descending on Jesus in the form of a dove was a representation of who Jesus was and what Jesus is going to invoke. Now, as I said, right, the crowd didn't know what was going on. It says that Jesus saw the Holy Spirit descend like a dove, but one other person saw it also, and that was John. John and Jesus were the only ones that knew what was going on, church. The Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus, right? Descending upon him, it was a sign that he is the Son of God. That was the sign. Why do we know this? Because if you go to John chapter 1, verse 29, it says this. It says, the next day he saw Jesus coming towards him. This is John the Baptist. And he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. Christ was eternal. I myself did not know him. He didn't know Jesus personally. But for this purpose, I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me, which was God, to baptize with water, said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Notice what he said. He said that he who baptizes, or excuse me, that on him who you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the one that baptizes with the Holy Spirit. It's Jesus is the one that gives us the Holy Spirit. It comes from him. So Jesus being baptized and the Holy Spirit coming down upon him, it was a sign. It was a sign of who Jesus was. And so Jesus is going to begin his mission after he is baptized. We're going to see him go into the desert for 40 days, for 40 days of temptation. There's an incredible story behind that that we need to grasp. And then I want to wrap up with verse 17. Verse 17 says, And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. This text is drawn from Genesis chapter 22, verse 2. Does anybody remember what happened in chapter 22 of Genesis? Abraham and Isaac. If you go to verse 2 of Genesis 22, it says this, He said, God, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Isaac, uh, Abraham was told to take his only son, whom he loved. Isaac was loved by Abraham. He was the promised child. Although Abraham had another son by the name of Ishmael, he was not the promised child. Isaac was the promised child, and he loved him. Some translations uh, say the, your favorite son, right? Because it, it wasn't that Abraham loved him more necessarily, but he was the favored son because he was the son of promise. Matthew brings this verse as a reminder 
of what Jesus' mission was going to be. Like Isaac, who was going to be offered up as a sacrifice, Jesus will be ultimately the sacrifice for all human beings, for all humankind. And so Matthew was drawing on this picture of, of Abraham, Father Abraham, ha- taking his only son to Moriah to be sacrificed. And so Jewish audiences would have known right off the bat what Matthew was alluding to here. Now, it's interesting in the sense that God says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And I think God was speaking for the moment. I think he was speaking for the future. Because the Bible tells us that God was pleased to bruise Jesus on the cross. If you go to Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10, it says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him who has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. It's hard to imagine God being pleased with Jesus going through what he went through. But ultimately, it was the plan of salvation and redemption that was being played out. And so God being pleased to bruise him, to put grief on him, God knew what the outcome was going to be. That those of us sitting here tonight at this table who are in a life-giving relationship with Jesus, right? That's the result of what Isaiah is talking about here in verse 10. And so now Jesus, he's, he's been baptized. He's been empowered with the Holy Spirit. And now he's ready to step into what God has for him. For three years, he will choose men and women to disciple. He will teach who God is because he is going to be God in the flesh. He's going to be the God man walking amongst his creation. He's going to remind the religious leaders it's about faith and not about works. And ultimately, he was going to lay down his life so that we could be free. Church, I want you to grasp this truth tonight as I close. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. You have to have the power of the Holy Spirit. And I know some people don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but then you have to explain to me Acts chapter 2, and you have to explain to me John chapter 20. They're two different events. And so for, for Jesus, right, to tell the disciples to go wait upon the Holy Spirit that will come what? In power. That tells me that that's something different. Because in John 20, it says he breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So something different was happening. At Pentecost, what happened? The disciples were given the power to do God's work. It says that when the Holy Spirit came upon them in power, that what looked like fire was above their heads. Okay? So something's happening. So when you, listen, you can not believe anything that you want to not believe. It doesn't mean that you're right. It doesn't mean that. Right? People don't believe God exists. It doesn't change the fact that he does. So there's always things in the Bible that we're going to disagree with and, and, and look at things differently. And I'm cool with that. If that's how you think, I'm okay with that. But what I'm telling you is that you're missing out on something. If you don't pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it changed mine and Pat's life. We were young believers. We didn't know what we were doing. And our pastor was with us over at our house one night. 
and another couple was with us there and, and the, our pastor's wife and we were reading the Bible and worshiping the Lord and singing and, and, and he says to us, uh, man, you all need to get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, man. You need to ask for it. We're like, whoa, well, tell us about what the, how this works. <laughs> we don't understand this. So he goes into scripture. He tells us these different things. He takes us to Luke, the chapter in Luke where I told you how much more the Holy Spirit will God give you if you ask. Okay, that sounds like to me you got to ask for it. You got to keep asking for more of it. And so we knelt around our coffee table and we started praying. And we just started asking God to give us the power to infuse us with what we needed. And it was incredible what happened that night. The Holy Spirit just came into our lives in a way that I can't even imagine. I, I, I was speaking in tongues. I didn't even know, what the heck am I doing? Right? Frank's interpreting. He has the, interp- Frank, he has the gift of interpretation. Mama Bear, man, she was levitating, you know? So no, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But let me tell you something. It was a powerful moment. And I'm going to tell you something. My whole life changed from that point on. And suddenly God had given me gifts I did not know I had. Right? They, were, they, were, they, they may not even been in me. But all I know is that they, they came out. I found out I had the gift of dreams and interpreting dreams and visions. Never knew that. Right? I can hear somebody, somebody can tell me a dream, and, and I'll tell them, you know what, let me pray about it. Or sometimes in that moment, the Lord will just give me what it is. That's not me, right? That's not me. The times when we've seen miraculous healings, that's not me. That's the Holy Spirit in me. But me being open to saying, okay, God, I know you can do the impossible. You can raise anybody from the dead if you want. The Holy Spirit is essential in ministry. If you're in ministry, you need the Holy Spirit. You need it. If you don't have it, your ministry will all, you'll never get more out of the ministry than where you're at. Why? Because you're operating on you. You got to operate on God. When we come back, we're going to be in Matthew looking at the 40 days in the wilderness with Jesus and the temptation that Jesus went through and the significance of that. Why? Why would Jesus, God in the flesh, have to go into the desert and be tempted by Satan? Oh, there's a lot of meat there for us. We might be in that one for a week or two. So, um, any questions? Oh, it says, and John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. He's saying, he's saying here, it says, <clears throat> I myself did not know him, but he who sent me, who sent him? God. He was sent by God. God says to John, the one you see the spirit descend on and remain, mm-hmm. that's, that's he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So John, must have been John the Baptist. No, I said that it was John and Jesus that both saw it. Yeah, they both saw that. Because I said Jesus wasn't the only one that saw it. I said John saw it also. And so it was a John and Jesus moment. So that, that John would for sure know, okay, this is, I'm calling out he's the Lamb of God, right? But he's saying, but this is how I really know he's the Lamb of God because I'm going to see this event happen. So, yeah, it, nothing in Scripture tells us that anybody else saw it. Ephesians tells us that once you, when you come into a relationship with Jesus, that you're sealed. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit. That's exactly Paul's words. He says you are sealed. John didn't even really understand what Jesus' mission was, right? He knew, that, he knew that he was the Lamb of God. He knew that. But even John, if you remember when he's in prison, began to doubt who Jesus was. And then he sends his disciples to go and find out, hey, is this really you? Are you, are you the one we're waiting for? The thought process at this point in time was that the Messiah was going to come. The, 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 the seers, uh, the Pharisees and those were, were confident that there was a Messiah that was going to come. They thought that they were going to be liberated from Rome. 
Even the disciples thought that. Even Paul thought that for some time, that, that this liberation that was going to happen was going to be from Rome. So could it be that he was speaking of Jesus? Maybe. Could be. Um, repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. They really thought God, God's kingdom was getting ready to come. And so just like us, we've been waiting you know, our lifetimes thinking that Jesus is going to come and establish his kingdom. So it could be. You know, so that's not something I really studied on this one, but it very well could be. I try to do the best I can to answer things on the fly. If I can't, I'll research it and get back to you guys. So um, because every question is great. Every question makes me go deeper. And so and I hope it makes you guys go deeper because you guys have the same Holy Spirit that I do that can speak to you and teach you things. So um, I want to encourage you guys to, to study to study the word. So, all right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for loving us, and thank you, God, that uh, you've given us your son, and you've uh, empowered us. You've sealed us with the Holy Spirit. We know that we are yours, Father, that we're yours for eternity, and we're so grateful for that, Lord. I thank you for my brothers and sisters, Lord, who, um, who just continue to seek you out, God, and continue to pursue you, Lord, and I pray, Father, tonight for those who are weary and tired, Lord, that you would uh, infuse them with energy and freshness, God, and I ask, Lord, that you would bless us with sleep tonight and awaken us tomorrow, God, for uh, whatever you have for uh, us to accomplish in your name, and Lord, I just thank you for this place that we're in, Lord, this building, and thank you for Brian and Carrie, Lord, I pray for them tonight, God, that you'd bless them and continue to bless their business, Lord, and Father, I know they love you so much, and uh, Father, um, just uh, continue to press into us, Lord, uh, more and more of your love, God. So thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus, and thank you, Holy Spirit. And it's in the awesome name of Jesus we pray and all the church said. Amen. Amen.